I love animals and my journey today, all my decisions, my choices are guided by this love. And uh, I studied veterinary sciences, I did animal biotechnology and the same love for animals brought me to this project on endangered species at CCMB. And this is where I came to CCMB almost 24 years back and at CCMB I met Jyotsna. Jyotsna was that time doing her PhD on tiger genetics with Dr. Lalji Singh. Dr. Lalji was then the director of CCMB and many people don't know this or do not remember this. Jyotsna is the first person to study tiger genetics in India. And whatever I know today, all the basics in population genetics is thanks to her. So we traveled extensively across the country. My children also grew up during this time. They traveled with me to many places. And the idea was that we try to extract the maximum possible information from very poor quality source of DNA, degraded samples and very poor quality sources of DNA. And that is usually the fecal sample. When we go to the forest, it is very difficult to see animals. Uh, many of them are rare, they are elusive, they are nocturnal animals, so it's very difficult to spot an animal, but they do leave their mark behind. So we do get fecal samples. And uh, so we, uh, we developed several protocols over the last 15 years to extract DNA and to get a lot of information from this DNA. The most powerful outcome of this work, the most powerful and practical outcome of this work has been in forensics. So a tiger, a species like the tiger is not safe even in a protected environment like the zoo. Even in the zoo they can be killed. So this case was way back in 2000 when a tig young tigress, she was just one and a half year old, a young tig tigress was killed inside the zoo and she was skinned and this happened inside the protected environment. So this probably marks the first tiger case for CCMD. We started work on forensics right then. And following that, we have got hundreds of cases from all over the country on tiger poaching cases, tiger deaths. And that, that is just one aspect of forensics which happens at uh, CCMB. We do a uh, lot of other work on other species also. But specifically on tigers, we have got a lot of cases. A species like tiger, and I think most of you all know that wildlife trafficking or wildlife poaching is on par with some of the biggest crimes in the world, like arms or drugs or human trafficking. So this is equal to that uh, level of crime. And a, a tiger is not safe in this country unless we tackle this threat of poaching. And every part, every body part of the tiger is, is important. Be it claws, teeth, whiskers, bones, even the meat, the flesh, is used in some or the other form in international market and also within India. So it's important that we tackle these problems and CCMB and me, uh, my team have been involved in uh, assisting the forest department and police in resolving several cases. But this is not the only threat to wildlife. There is another very big threat to the existence of wildlife in India and also across the world and that is loss of forest. I'll use a simple comparison, a simple analogy to explain to you all uh, the importance of forest. And here I'll compare two exquisite natural uh, systems. They are marvels of natural engineering, the human body. So here, as you know, uh, I think most of you all will understand this analogy. So the human body has organs and each organ is specialized to perform a set of functions. Now, uh, but some of these organs like the liver, lungs, kidney, even heart or intestine can take abuse to a certain extent. They can uh, take injury to a certain extent and they can keep functioning for years together. 
but there are certain organs like the brain or the spinal cord which even the slightest injury can have drastic effects and all these organs can function perfectly only if they are networked together so we need a network of veins and arteries and nerves so that these organs are connected they can communicate with each other and and they can uh, actually perform their functions optimally a forest is also like that if a forest is vast uh, spanning continents like the amazon or the congo basin rainforest it is they span several countries if the forest is that vast then they do not require uh, it they basically encompass all the functions they encompass the complete biodiversity and the communication between different organisms but in india we have forests which are broken down so most of the forests in india are not more than 1000 square kilometers big so it is important that these forests are connected to each other this connectivity is now vital for survival of wildlife vital for the survival of biodiversity and vital for our own survival so but again there are various types of forests in india and some of them just like the organs in the human body some of them can take a lot of abuse and destruction and still perform but some forests like the mangroves are more sensitive and require higher level of protection we have to be sensitive to their existence now um, as you can see over the last 40 years we have uh, or before that or itself we lost a lot of forest cover in india we have approximately 20 to 25% of indian landmass under forest cover and uh, this forest cover is subject to monsoon the years we have better rainfall we have better forest cover better tree growth and the years when the uh, rainfall is less there is uh, more dryness but all the uh, forests in india except maybe the western ghats and the forests in northeast all the protected areas in india are small and they are embedded in human dominated landscapes so there is a, a lot of disturbance around the forest area and unless there is connectivity uh, they are not going to be able to perform their optimal ecological functions so uh, over the last 15 years i have worked on several species largely on tigers and all these species which i show here they are all keystone or flagship species they all represent forest cover and the connectivity of forest they they represent this and they also depend on it for their own survival these animals depend on connectivity for their own survival so it is important that whatever studies we do or whatever policies we develop keep these uh, behavior of these animals in mind so that at the same time we can protect the biodiversity and forest cover in our country so how do we understand these species we have conducted several studies using dna to understand what is the requirement of tigers in different areas how do they find their mate how do they reproduce in a particular area and how do they move from one area to another these are crucial questions it's not enough that we have 3000 tigers or 4000 tigers it's also important that we understand their behavior and understand their requirements so i'll just explain a small uh, experiment which we conducted and this is very close to my heart this was a small study conducted in panna and it was done in collaboration with researchers from wildlife institute of india this is a small glimpse into tiger behavior like uh, it's very difficult to actually see this in the wild but we were fortunate so panna lost all its tigers tigers went extinct there locally and uh, tigers were translocated from other protected area in bandargarh uh, sorry in madhya pradesh like bandargarh bench kana tigers were translocated to panna because these tigers were radio collared we could actually see how they establish territory and how they uh, move around in the protected area in panna and uh, um, 
if you can see the gray gray uh, range is of the male and the green and the orange are the two females which were translocated there so only one male and multiple females were translocated to panna and because the home range of the male overlaps that of the females it was assumed that that male is mating with all the females but that did not happen and when we did dna analysis we found that there was one particular female t2 who was translocated from kana she did not mate with the translocated male t3 instead she went out into the greater landscape she found another male and she produced babies with that male even the second time when uh, in her second litter also she did not mate with the translocated male instead she mated with a sub adult who was born in that landscape so this small study shows that mate selection is a very powerful phenomenon in nature and we have to pay attention to this it is not enough that we put one male tiger and three female tigers and expect that they will mate it's not going to happen we have to pay attention to certain biological phenomena and uh, also uh, using dna we uh, studied large landscapes like central india and western ghats and saw how tigers navigate this landscape uh, in central india we have several protected areas which are embedded in human dominated landscape with a lot of infrastructure development so is tiger able to navigate such a landscape what are the barriers to movement if it is able to move then what is promoting movement it is important that we understand this because in future whatever developmental activities happen should keep these parameters in mind and development should work around this and uh, it is also important that we understand tiger movement because as we are losing forest cover and as we are losing connectivity these tigers are getting into encounters with human beings it is very unfortunate because these animals are not man eaters they do not want to kill human beings or eat human beings they are not targeting that these are unfortunate encounters because the forests are shrinking and because humans are entering forest area and therefore these animals when they come face to face there are casualties either humans die or the animal dies and we need to keep this in mind if we really want to save tiger or any such species which navigates large landscapes and in the unfortunate event where we are not able to save the animal in its wild habitat if there is a situation where the animal goes extinct in the wild then we have to bring these animals into captivity and we have to do conservation breeding but when now it's become a fancy word conservation breeding of wild animals but there are certain key questions which have to have to be answered they have to be addressed if we want to do conservation breeding the first one is why why do we want to do conservation breeding obviously because the species has gone extinct in the wild but also this more important why is why did it go extinct in the first place what were the, what were the factors which drove this animal to disappear so was it because of infrastructure development was it because the uh, because the habitat was lost was it because of poaching so until this problem is addressed it is going to be very difficult to bring back the species to that particular place the second question is where where should conservation breeding be done the breeding should be done bang in the middle of the range of the animal the animal should not be shifted or air lifted or taken away from its original range and should not be bred in an alien environment so we cannot uh, supposing an animal is endemic or it is found in the western ghats the captive breeding center should be there so that its food is natural so that the environment is very uh, natural and the animal feels at home there not that you take it away to some coastal city or you breed a uh, uh, breed these animals in europe in a zoo in europe and say that this is insurance against extinction no this is not going to be this is not going to happen because 
There are a lot of changes in captivity. It is an alien environment, the food is different, these animals are exposed to antibiotics and several drugs which change the physiology, the gut microbiome and many other things within the animal and such animals cannot go back to the wild. So it is very important that we address this question properly. And third one is how. How do we breed these animals in captivity? Each one has a different requirement, a different uh, condition which is required. But also the other how is how do we remove the human imprinting which they get in captivity. These animals are kept in a luxury environment and they are given all these fine foods, semi-digested food which they do not get in the wild. So when these animals go back to the wild, how are they going to forget that? How are they going to remember that humans are actually dangerous for them? They have to go back to the wild and not come towards human settlements in search of food. This is especially true for the large herbivores and the carnivores, like predators, like tigers. It is very important that we keep these factors in mind. And so each animal, each species, requires some level of research, some level of understanding in their behavior and physiology. I'll leave you all with this image of this animal. It looks very content. It looks as if it is happy in this big landscape, but it is actually chained. The legs have chained to it. So it's not enough that we have animals. It's not enough just to be alive. It's not enough. Numbers are not sufficient. It's not enough that we have 4,000 tigers or 16,000 elephants or whatever number of leopards. It is important that these animals are free and they live in the wild as wild as possible. That's when we can save our nature.